Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for inviting me here today, Maura and Sinead. Um, as mentioned, I'm um, from Cork, the real capital. And um, I'm a lecturer in nursing there. And my background is in oncology nursing. And I'm going to talk to you about fatigue. And um, when I was in clinical practice, um, it's a, a symptom that really, really, um, you know, it was so obvious to me how it affected patients' lives. And I could see literally personalities changing, people that were really upbeat and were determined that, you know, that they were going to get through their cancer very positively. Um, fatigue was so profound that it really impacted on them psychologically, physically, etc. And then when I went into college and um, looking, looking at the literature, it was something that, um, you know, is, um, is actually the most severe symptoms. So when um, I actually did my PhD in it and studied about 300 patients there in recent years. So I'm going to hopefully talk about some practical issues today and a little bit of my findings as well of what patients stated that helped them. So fatigue is, um, it is the most frequent symptom of cancer and cancer treatments, regardless of the type of cancer, and especially with multiple myeloma. It's the most severe, but it's also the most under-treated, and it's something that, unfortunately, that is the same for, you know, an, a number of years. It is a symptom that um, I suppose there isn't a magic pill for. We can do a lot to treat symptoms like pain, um, vomiting, etc. but unfortunately there isn't, um, a, you know, a, a magic tablet there for fatigue. Um, it's also very distressing, it's persistent and it's subjective. It really does differ from person to person, even those that are going through, um, um, you know, the same type of treatment. And it doesn't just affect the person um, um, physically, we all know what physical fatigue is like, but it also has, cancer-related fatigue has emotional components, all right, it can cause an awful lot of people a lot of anxiety. There is a big link, Eugene was talking earlier on this morning about depression. We know that there is a huge link with depression and fatigue. And like he rightly said, the symptoms of fatigue are actually the exact same as symptoms of depression. Now, one in four um, people who um, develop cancer will develop um, depression who've not previously had a depression, um, you know, have, have had treatment for depression. And, um, you know, it is something that we do need to look at. Is, is the person depressed or is it fatigue? Um, Cancer-related fatigue also has cognitive, um, a huge cognitive impact. And I suppose that's something that you don't visually see, but a lot of people will describe, you know, that their memory is affected. And that can be affected for quite a period of time. And of course, that's going to impact on their ability to work and their ability to function, be they, you know, working at home, etc. Et so it really um, impacts on the whole person, all right, physically, psychologically, emotionally, socially, etc. Um, CRF or right, cancer related fatigue it's also usually not isolated um, it occurs in symptom clusters I think somebody mentioned that earlier on all right about symptom clusters and it may be and I suppose it can be you know it's like one symptom can impact on the other so if somebody has pain it, you know and they may have um, um, problems sleeping as well, that's all going to impact on um, fatigue levels. And of course, if somebody is fatigued, their sleep is going to be um, affected. And of course, an anemia, psychological problems like anxiety and distress is also going to hugely um, impact on um, fatigue. So I suppose just to classify it, all right, and for people to um, understand and anybody here in the room who has had um, cancer-related fatigue will know what I'm talking about. Generally, acute fatigue is something that um, occurs, um, you know, when you've been working hard, etc. And it's of a short duration, hours, days, weeks, etc. It's of a rapid onset, and it's usually, um, you know, you'll get over it after a holiday or, a, you know, a good weekend's rest or that. But chronic fatigue and the fatigue of cancer-related fatigue is not relieved by rest. It's overwhelming and may lead to disability. And many people 
um, may have to give up their jobs, work part time. Um, and, you know, it isn't just fatigue. Obviously, it's worse during the time that people are having treatments. But this fatigue can go on for many months and even years, especially when we're, you know, talking about transplant patients and that they may um, talk about quite overwhelming fatigue for years after treatment. In fact, you know, there's a lot of research showing that as well. And people will describe that they go to bed, they might have spent 10 hours in bed and they get up just feeling as tired and as exhausted as, as they went. They don't feel refreshed by a night's sleep, um, etc. And it's it's abnormal and excessive, all right? And um, as I said, it affects the whole, the whole holistically it affects the person physically, psychologically and spiritually as well. All right. And for some people, obviously, it may have more psychological components and for other people, um, physical. And um, I do want to stress the fatigue that people have from the side effects of cancer is very different to the fatigue and um, stress, you know, that people of the, the general public will have. So the main symptoms of fatigue, all right, and um, I suppose a lot of people can relate to things like lack of energy, all right, when we're all tired, there's lack of energy, things like shortness of breath, sleepiness, tiredness even after sleeping that I mentioned. Um, but other things, all right, um, certainly the um, decreased concentration, and this is something huge, and it's something that can be very problematic for people, okay? Um, as I said, memory loss, being able to, you know, not remember names, places, um, even having conversations, having fairly short conversations with, with people can be very difficult. Um, people may have decreased or disturbed sleep, and of course, if people are already experiencing a degree of insomnia, um, perhaps from the treatments, um, it's going to further impact on um, fatigue as well. Weakness, limb heaviness, and feeling unrefreshed. Um, I suppose the main causes of, of um, fatigue, as we know, are related to the treatments, all right? Now, saying that somebody will, by the time that they're diagnosed, will automatically probably have a level of fatigue. Um, Firstly, surgery, all right? Um, people who have surgery, um, the post-op fatigue may last up to six months after um, treatment. But of course, for the majority of people, they're not going to, they're going to go from surgery on to perhaps chemotherapy, all right? Or, or if they're going and uh, having a transplant, um, there isn't, you know, time for the body to recover. And issues like having, you know, sedation, um, infection, perhaps they have infections, um, altered sleep, immobility, post-surgery. Um, um, we all know that, you know, if, if you are quite immobile, your body, you lose your muscle tone, which is going to impact on your fatigue further as well. In relation to chemotherapy, um, practically all chemotherapy agents um, will cause a level of fatigue, all right? And especially the drugs that were mentioned there earlier this morning, cyclophosphamide, etc., And especially patients who are having high dose chemotherapy for transplants will um, um, experience fatigue, all right? Which can be, as I said, very debilitating. Um, radiotherapy also causes um, um, fatigue, perhaps not to the same extent, but it certainly does. And um, of course, the biological therapies um, they, these tend to cause the most severe types of fatigue, all right? And there is actually quite a, a link as well with the biological therapies and the psychological impact, and that is supposed to be very much linked to because, as I said, biological therapies cause high degrees of fatigue, and again, the fatigue is linked with, um, you know, anxiety um, and that, and psychological, um, the psychological effect. Um, some other further, um, I suppose, fields, physiological causes would be um, obviously things like if people lose a lot of weight, if they're not eating properly, um, if their metabolic rate is, is increased, all right, maybe because of the actual um, disease itself. Um, other um, things would be, for example, besides treatments, all right, um, if people are on hormone therapy, or certainly drug therapy, even things like cough suppressants, um, antiemetic drugs, antihistamines, um, these, and um, maybe people are on night sedation or that as well, if they're having, having problem sleeping. So these will all have a knock-on effect as well on um, fatigue. 
So I suppose it is something that's there. As I said earlier on, unfortunately, we don't have a magic um, pill for it. But what I suppose to try and manage it as best as pro possible. Um, it is important for you as um, you know patients um, and not just while you're having treatment but going on into hopefully you know years after treatment as well that you can monitor yourself and in relation to fatigue it should be you know the best guidelines are that patients should be assessed for fatigue on their initial um, treatment and this should be ongoing as well and um, um, I suppose again and as I said I did a study on um, on cancer fatigue in um, patients undergoing chemotherapy but I looked at self-care as well and again you know the literature is showing us that the more that people you know self-care and try and um, you know I suppose try and help in, in conjunction with medical staff to, ma to manage or to try and help with their own care that they're empowered and um, I would advise people, you know, to keep a diary, all right, is there something? A lot of people generally find that fatigue is worst in certain parts of the afternoon, but that may differ for people. All right, keep a di diary or keep a journal. When is the fatigue at its worst, all right? Um, it is advised, and if you are very tired, it is advised to have a rest, all right? But years ago, people were advised to, you know, sleep a lot, whereas that isn't really the best practice now and people are advised not to sleep for more than you know when you do have a nap by all means but not sleep for more than 20 minutes because otherwise it's going to affect you at night um, so I suppose the pattern when is the onset of fatigue is it is it you know if you're having regular chemotherapy is it four or five days afterwards or you know for people that are post treatment is there anything is it you know um, as I said is it mid morning mid afternoon um, is there a certain pattern and and its intensity as well and I suppose by doing this you can tell the nursing and medical staff as well the impact you know of it for you um, is there any other treatment related symptoms all right are you having other treatments and maybe talk to your GP about that is there something that, that can be changed um, and sleep and rest patterns all right and, and these are huge and um, I suppose there is a lot of and somebody mentioned earlier on there is a lot of focus today on you know sleeping and, and good sleep but and, uh, and thankfully there is a lot that we know that we can do to help sleep such as you know not have your mobile phone and electronics and all of that in the room but to actually are you know if people are having a couple of hours naps in the afternoon then they're probably not going to sleep properly at night okay so so I suppose keep an eye on all of those things the optimum of sleep is eight hours all right um probably you know very few of us get that that is the optimum but do keep an eye on um how much sleep you're getting um, and is there anything that will benefit sleep? And as I said, things like sleep hygiene, not having, you know, yourself coffee, um, tea, food late at night, um, electronics and all of that will hopefully help um, sleep as well. In relation to nutritional intake and high hydration levels as well, um, I suppose a lot of people, while they are having treatment, um, may be off their food, um, they may not have... Um, you know the ability to or they may be feeling nauseous etc maybe people that are living on their own mightn't feel they don't have the energy to food to cook meals but trying to maintain um you know a good um nutritional intake with certainly protein and the literature is showing us that protein to have protein in, in your diet will will help to a certain degree um with fatigue and certainly you know um plenty fruit and vegetables and making sure that you're well hydrated okay um, is very important but I suppose again you know as keeping a journal of this are you eating enough are you drinking enough what is your sleep like are you s sleeping more um, late morning um, etc um, in relation to multiple myeloma and um, there isn't a huge amount of studies done in relation to fatigue and multiple myeloma um, unfortunately yet but um, what is done is showing that multiple myeloma 
people have ha uh, quite high degrees of, of fatigue and for all of the reasons that we um, heard about there this morning. Um, and this would be in relation to, to things like obviously like anemia. And you probably all know here that when you're if you're anemic, you are automatically going to be possibly quite breathless and very tired and fatigued as well. Um, studies have also demonstrated high um, CRP levels may affect um, um, fatigue and bacterial and viral infections often you know are, are unfortunately common with multiple myeloma um, as we heard this morning um, overworked kidneys are right the kidneys might often um, not function properly which again is going to impact on fatigue levels and um, this high levels of cytokines in, in the blood, proteins that affect your immune system. So these are all, and of course, ongoing pain, sorry, which um, you know some people have spoke about here this morning. So these are all the reasons why um, fatigue may be so um, prominent uh, um, with multiple myeloma. And as I mentioned, for bone marrow transplant patients who are having high um, levels of um, chemotherapy, there would pro probably be, and some of you may have experienced that, you will develop um, fatigue quite um, you know, soon after treatment, and this may go on for a period of time, all right? But it, and my last point there, it, it, it will be resolved in time, all right? And I suppose I want to you know, give that note today that um, while it can be very frustrating for people, now some people will say that years after treatment, that they may never have their full energy levels back. But some people will describe, you know, a, a, a new, a different newness for them. Um, but the main thing is, I suppose, while the fatigue is at its highest, to try and, um, you know, self-care and get all, um, I suppose, try and help the body as much as, as it can. Um, in relation to quality of life, it certainly has um, shown that um, it has a very profound effect on, on people's lives. All right? And as I said as well, it's very much linked with depression and causes a lot of anxiety. And I suppose it's very frustrating as well for people if they can't you know, feel that they are getting treatment for it. Um, I mentioned earlier on, people's ability to work can be affected. Okay. Um, but again, a lot of people will find that they can go back to work um, after a period of time. It does have an impact on family dynamics and family roles. And some people, and especially I found in my study, um, especially women were very frustrated um, because they felt their role as mother was affected. Um, and the same, obviously, for, for all people that they, you know, their roles, whether it's um, as a parent in a family or whether it's, you know, work is very important to them, they can no longer do that um, for a period of time, or maybe they need to change their, their job because of their fatigue. Maybe they had a very physical job, and that can have a huge impact on somebody, obviously, psychologically. So fatigue, unfortunately, um, can change family dynamics, all right? Um, but it can also, you know, people, people are very resilient, they do adjust, and sometimes people may need to readjust their lives as well. Um, okay, so these are just um, some qualitative comments from my own um, study that I said there was about 300 people in it. So I've just grouped it into different, um, I suppose, the impact that it had. Um, so. A lot of people felt that it had a huge impact on their normal life, requiring a lot more effort. Um, it occurs very quickly, often taking you by surprise. You could be out enjoying yourself and you have just to stop. You feel too tired to talk and even to stand. I had to stop going out, stop having any social life. This was a comment from one person, all right? And a lot of people felt that, that the impact it had on their normal life for certainly the, the period of time where they were having treatment and for some, some time afterwards. Um, the effect of meaning, emotionally debilitating and mood changing, all right, the impact psychologically. Um, one person commented, I feel very frustrated at home because of my lack of, of ability to contribute to my children's lives. I feel much less needed as a mother. I mentioned that earlier on. Um, 
people found the sensory impact physically exhausting and extreme tiredness. And this was one lady, I remember her, she was saying that at night when I climbed to the stairs going to bed, when I got to the top, I couldn't move as I felt so drained. I was so exhausted, I literally can't put it into words. And the cognitive impact, which, uh, as I said, is, is something that probably isn't recognised enough, um, but it's something that um, people very much do um, experience, especially um, sometimes it's, it's, late, it's you know, considered chemo brain, but it is fatigue. Um, affecting thought process, poor concentration. Um, an example with this one co comment. After week one of chemo, I realised how spaced out I actually was. I forgot conversations I had with people in the previous weeks and who I visited due to the severity of the, of the fatigue. And as I said, the cognitive impact was huge. It was, um, of all the different factors that I looked at, um, it was the impact that it had mostly on people, all right, because I suppose they felt their brains weren't functioning properly and their ability to have conversations, which of course affects their social life, it affects them um, emotionally um, as well. So how do we manage it? All right? As I said, there is no magic um, um, pill, but within the, you know, um, the treatments that, and, and within the treatments and that, that we're having as well. Um, treatment for pain. Certainly if somebody is having pain, as I mentioned earlier on, it's going to affect them. It may be affecting their sleep, which again will have a knock-on effect. And um, if somebody is having pain, they should be trying to, um, or it should be treated, all right? People don't need to be in, in pain today. Um, emotionally distressed, all right? Um, and I'll talk about that as well in a minute. But um, if somebody is very emotionally dis distressed, anxious, worried, etc., they're having sleepless nights, um, is there something, all right? And while Eugene was talking about earlier on, and absolutely, you know, um, um, medical services today are very slow putting people on antidepressants that don't need it, okay? But um, sometimes there is a, sp a place for medication, maybe somebody nee needs, you know, something like an anxiolytic something just to help them during that initial period of time, all right? Or is there more, um, you know, complementary therapies or that that could help them through emotional um, distress as well? Um, anemia, all right, um, certainly when people um, receive blood transfusions. Um, psychostimulants is an area that has, you know, they've been looked at um, for um, a number of years to try and help with fatigue, but there isn't anything definite that we know of yet that will help. And then in relation to non-pharmacological, okay, and I suppose these are the things that you yourself can, can help. And exercising for a number of years, the most supporting evidence is the effectiveness of exercising. And while that might vary, somebody else spoke earlier about only having five minutes, all right, um, some people, and especially, you know, following their treatment, may be able to do it half an hour, all right, I think the recommendations is half an hour, um, five times a week. And in relation to exercise as well, um, any type of exercise is good. Aerobic is very much recommended. And I think as well, um, um, you know, to be able to go out and get some fresh air, maybe walk through nature, walk by the sea, or that is going to have a psychological good effect as well. Okay. So, um, sorry, I'm talking too much here. I'll, I'll, I'll hurry up, all right. So just some other things, all right. So exercise, anyway, I can't stress if possible, aerobic exercise. Other things that have been found to be beneficial, um, psychoeducational interventions, cognitive behavioral therapy. All right, Eugene mentioned that earlier on. That mightn't be available. A lot of these um, therapies here, things, especially complementary therapies, acupuncture, they have found in recent years that acupuncture has been found to be beneficial for fatigue. It also will help for sleep and it will also um, um, may help for pain, which you know will, will help with um, fatigue as well. Yoga. Um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Mindfulness is very um, the buzzword at the moment, and people can do that themselves. Um, and what I would want to stress is, um, and it was mentioned earlier on today, by trying to access your local um, cancer centre. I know we're looking down in Cork, there's Arc House is very, very um, beneficial and a huge amount of patients use it. I know they have Arc House here in Dublin as well, but if at all possible to try and um, access your local cancer centre 
and if there isn't one near you to get on to the Irish Cancer Society, a lot of these treatments here, um, things like acupuncture, um, there's yoga groups, there's reflexology, massage, aromatherapy, they're available free for patients that will help. Um, and I mentioned journal um, writing, maybe you need a dietitian to help you um, with, with, with diet as well. And um, I will just, um, I won't talk too much more, but I suppose just a very important point would be in relation to, to um, my study was that the um, um, participants, the, the patients found that having support from family and friends was the most beneficial for them. So again, you know, the, the support networks that we have are, are very, very um, um, important. And when you are going through fatigue, you're not at your normal level of functioning, obviously. And some days your energy will be okay and you're able to fairly maintain, you know, what your normal life and other days you need that help. And to, you know, get that help, leave your family and friends help you um, uh, as much as possible. Um, other things then that, that um, the um, patients um, um, stated were beneficial for them were things like having a healthy diet, having hobbies, chatting with their friends and um, trying to psych psychologically adjust their mood and be more positive. Um, and just the um, interviews with people then found that just the categories there of rest and relaxation, um, having a positive outlook, strategies to promote their psychological well-being, professional support um, and family support um, were most beneficial, okay? And um, I suppose just in conclusion, all right, um, all people should be advised of the likelihood of developing fatigue. Um, it ha physical activity and psycho psychological interventions have more supporting evidence to date in the management of um, fatigue. And I suppose finally, while it is debilitating and a potentially severe problem, it does improve in time and many people do return to their normal level of functioning, all right? So, I, you know, just to take that positively. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Patricia.